Hi, this is Vulture, and I would like to teach you the coolest trick I know. I used it to make the stretchy cord on this grappling hook. In progress, don't judge me on my artwork. I also used it to make these two parachute cords in a game called skydiving. And Sensei J used those same commands to power the body segments on this dragon. The key lies in three magical commands called Lerp, Look, and Scale, and putting them all together. Lerp is under Basic Math. It's on the Operators tab. It stands for Linear Interpolation. It's a way to find a position between two other positions. In this case, I'm using it to position this rod between these two spheres. And the way I do that is I attach my LERP script to the rod and I pass in the two spheres as parameters for bottom and top. The way the script is structured is that when the world is started, we're going to send the update loop to itself and then we're going to send it back to itself so it's on a loop. And we're going to move the rod to the linear interpolation between the position of the bottom sphere and the position of the top sphere. And this number says go 50% of the way between them. So if I were to change this number to something else, like 20%, you can see now it's going to be 20% of the way between them. This event down here called swap in, I'm just going to swap this command in. It shows you that there's two ways to do the same thing. We're going to add the position of the bottom sphere to the position of the top sphere and then we're going to chop that in half and then we're going to move the sphere to that position and you can see that it behaves in exactly the same way. Look at is this command down here at the bottom of the vector math section of your operators tab. This can be a hard one to understand sometimes but what it basically does is it rotates an object toward a vector. It takes um, vector information and turns it into a rotation. So what I've done over here is I have the same structure as the previous script. When world is started, we're sending update to itself and we're sending it back to itself. And the look at, when it's dropped in, it says look towards and it's being dropped in as a rotational command. Rotate self to, self being the rod. We're going to rotate it to a direction, which is what you get when you subtract the current position from the position of the top sphere. It's going to give us a new vector and then look towards, look at, we'll turn it into a rotation. What this command over here does says, well, um, we're going to rotate it, first of all, so that the Z vector, the positive Z axis of this rod, is always looking toward the thing we want it to look toward. And what this command up here does, 010, says once you've done that, what do you consider to be up? And up in this case is going to be Y plus. So that's what look toward is. It's a very useful command for constructing things like steering wheels or other control mechanisms on vehicles. Scale to is the last command we're going to throw into the mix here. It's under the motion tab under instant motion. And the way I'm using it here is to adjust the scale of the rod in the middle to equal the distance between these two spheres. And the way we're doing that, again, is through our update loop that sends to itself. The first thing we're going to find out is what is the distance between the upper and lower spheres and we're going to subtract the positions of them and then we're going to find the length of that vector that's between them so we're going to use the magnitude command and that's just going to return a single number in this case uh, in meters so the scale command then what we're going to say is send scale self to a new vector that accepts x y and z but we're not going to adjust the x at all. We're going to say the new vector is the x, whatever the scale of self is. 
the y vector is whatever the scale of self is again but z we're going to pass in to the new z because all i want to do is lengthen this thing along the z axis in this case i don't want to change x i don't want to change y then it scales it and then it's going to send the update to itself and behave like that now i have another event down here called swap in just to show you that again there's more than one way to do the same thing um, in this case I'm setting distance to be the distance from the top to the bottom. So this is a little bit more plain English than that. Uh, this may be easier to use. You just say, what's the distance from one thing to another? And it returns a number. And then you pass that into the scale command. And it does exactly the same thing. All right, so this is where the magic starts to happen. I'm going to put lerp, look, and scale all together into the same function. Here's my update loop, which comes back to itself. We're going to move the rod to the linear interpolation of the two spheres, halfway between them. We're going to rotate it to look toward the top sphere. We're going to find the distance between the two spheres, and then we're going to scale it to the distance of the two spheres. And when you do that all together on this rod in the middle, it turns it into stretchy string. And I think that is so cool. Up here you'll notice I have another event, and all this does is it transfers the ownership of the two spheres to my headset, which makes all that movement around a little more responsive. What I have over here is one other really cool thing. This is structured just like the other script, um, except I'm attaching it to the rod by itself. That says when I grab the rod, force release on it, which makes me drop it, and then it starts sending that update loop. All of these commands are just like the last script. We're going to move the rod to the lerp. We're going to rotate it to look. We're going to scale it to the distance. But instead of the distance between two spheres, it's going to be between the positions of my left hand and my right hand. You can also see that my player ID captured up here is being passed in as a parameter to all of these commands. And what happens is, and this kind of blew my mind when I did this, was I grabbed it drops it, and now this thing is stuck between the positions of my hands, like taffy. And I'm not even grabbing them right now. It's just staying where it is. And I thought that was really neat. I'm going to give you a breakdown of how this works. This is a tool, this is a prototype that I imagine would be useful in games, such as the frog mini game, where you grab objects and then you release them maybe into a basket of some sort for points. Um, the way this works, first let's look at the, um, the objects. We have a hook group, and inside of it we have a projectile launcher, and we have a trigger. Um, that's all there is other than having uh, an object which we can set to be um, interactive with physics. Oh, and we also have this thing up here. This is an invisible cube which will become visible and will stretch between the object that you capture and the trigger over here. Um, so that's an independent free-floating object there. We have two scripts. One is called the hook group, which is attached to the entire tool. And then we have another one called the hook, which is attached to the projectile launcher. So really the setup is sort of just a traditional projectile launcher setup where the hook group is attached to this. You grab it, you pull the trigger, and it says launch from projectile launcher. You hit whatever it is, uh, and everything else is taken care of by the projectile launcher. So let's look at the hook group up here. First, we have some ownership transfers taking place. This is on uh, local scripting to improve responsiveness. So when you grab the grappling hook gun, we're going to transfer ownership of the projectile launcher, that free-floating cord, and the interior trigger to the player. And likewise, when it's released, everything is going to go back to the server. So that's pretty straightforward. When the index trigger is pressed, then we're going to launch from the projectile launcher. You'll notice that this is inside of a Boolean, 
called index trigger disabled. So this will only happen if the index trigger is not disabled. And the reason why I am putting this inside of a disable Boolean is because while the hook is engaged and it's reeling the object in and you're moving it around and whatnot, I don't want people to continue to be able to pull the index trigger and mess up the whole process. So that's where this event comes in. This is received from the projectile launcher. Once the projectile launcher senses that it has hit the object, it's going to send this event called stop firing back to the main grappling hook gun, and it's going to set index trigger disabled to true. So then that will prevent this thing from operating up there. Um, button one is when you want to release the object. So you've had it here, it's sitting on the end of your gun for a while, and now you want to drop it into your basket or whatever. So at this point, index trigger disabled is set to false so that we can then, you know, fire the gun again when we want. And then it's going to send this event, release it back to the projectile launcher. Remember, the projectile launcher is running the show after this. So when release it is received by the projectile launcher, it will let the ball drop again and get ready for the next firing. So let's go over to the projectile launcher script, which is in this thing here called the hook. Um, this also runs on local scripting. The when world is started event fires when the script starts processing. And I just wanted to be able to capture who is the owner, who is the player, who is the owner of the projectile launcher, because we're going to need that down here. Um, when projectile hits an interactive object, this is uh, the standard event listener that you put with a projectile launcher. Whatever it hits, this information is received from whatever has been hit. And I'm just going to go ahead and save a reference to that object and to this variable called the object to be used later on. So that's why it says to reference later. Uh, transfer ownership of the object to the owner. So I want to make sure everything is running on the player's headset. So whatever object has been hit, I want the processing of it to be transferred to the owner. So that way we're not having any kind of weird latency delays between the, uh, the headset and the server. Hooked in is a Boolean that's going to be controlling all these looped events down here. So when hooked in is true, we're going to be firing the looped events. When hooked in later on gets set to false, it's going to break us out of the looped events. Stop firing is an event that uh, you saw earlier. It sends that command back to the hook group uh, and it disables the index trigger. So with all that being happening here, we're now going to send an event called get ready to self. And the reason it's being sent after one second is to give a second for this thing to take place. Once the ownership transfers come into the headset, then we're going to do everything else. Get ready now. See, it's received on a delay. Get ready is going to do some things to the cord. It's going to set that free floating cord to be visible. And then it's going to send this event called cord stretch to self containing uh, the parameter of the object that's been hit. So cord stretch is all of this lerp look scale stuff we've been talking about. This is sent on that loop so long as hooked in is true. And as everything you've seen before, we're going to move the cord to halfway between the object and the projectile launcher. We're going to rotate the cord to look toward the object that's been hit. And we're going to scale the cord to between the object that's been hit and the projectile launcher. And we're going to send that on a loop. So that's going to create that illusion of there being a, a rope between the object and the projectile launcher as it gets reeled in. So let's go back up here to get ready. Now let's talk about how the object gets reeled in. That's going to be, ha that's going to happen from this event called get it. That's going to be sent back to the projectile launcher after half a second containing the reference to the object that was hit, which we set up there. Get it is just basically a command to reel it in. So when get it is received, provided we're hooked into it, we're going to move the object that we hit to the position of the holder area, which is that trigger that's down here, over half a second. 
So it's just going to go zoop. And then once it's there, we're going to start a new event called hold it. And that's going to happen after that half a second. Hold it reads exactly the same thing as get it. It's just going to move the object to the position of the holder area, except it's going to be happening instantly, and it's going to be happening on a loop. So as the player moves the grappling hook gun around, the object is going to stay there on the end because it's, it's hooked in, right? So later, now, the player wants to drop the object into his basket or, or off a cliff or, or whatever. He presses button one back at the hook group, which sends that event called release it to the hook, the projectile launcher. At that point, the Boolean hooked in is set to false, which breaks us out of all this looped stuff up here. And everything is going to get reset. The cord becomes invisible again. The object that we reel, reeled in becomes collidable and gravity enabled. So it's just going to drop off the end of the gun. And then finally, we're going to transfer the processing of that object back to the server. Now, the reason why we turned off vis um, collidability and gravity of the object as I was being reeled in is because I found that the move to and move uh, to over time com commands would be fighting against the, the physics of the group. So if gravity was on and I was trying to move it, it would start swinging around and doing all kinds of weird stuff. And if I didn't turn off collidability, it might hit the gun and then be bouncing off of it and, and then just more unpredictable stuff happening. So the these little prongs at the end of the grappling hook are set to be non-collidable. And of course, we're using a trigger, which is uh, not collidable. So that is basically it. Um, again, this is just a prototype, and I think it's going to be very useful in those types of guns where, you know, like the, the frog game and the mini games where you have the, the frog tongue comes out and, you know, capture a fly or any type of um, hunting gathering type of game. Uh, maybe later on someone could figure out how to make this thing throw. I haven't figured that part out yet. Maybe you will. Oh, no, don't go away, ball. Here we go. It comes back. Well, I hope you found that helpful. I look forward to seeing how you use those commands in your creations. Please send a message to Vulture667, that's me, if you'd like to have a copy of this asset for your games. Thank you.